Okay, hello, my name is Marius. I'm an editor at Software and Support Media, and I would like to welcome you to this talk at the API and Services Online Conference. And I have the great pleasure to introduce you now to Vaseline uh, Pisuria, um, who is CTO and founder of Waylay, and uh, who will be speaking on the topic solving the weak spots of serverless with a directed acyclic graph model. All right, thanks. Uh, and uh, I think we have to mute the just a moment. All right. Okay. And um, before I give over to Vesselin, um, just a little bit of information. You can use the chat in SwapGuard to get help by your te technical stuff and if there are any problems, okay. but you can also use it for just chatting and commenting on the session. And you can also ask questions via the integrate Q&A tool or via chat. If there's time, Vesselin will answer the questions after the session. Okay, so let's start. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks uh, for, uh, for this conference, I really enjoyed. And uh, like I said, I will be talking today about the uh, solving the weak spots of the service. And let me share my screen and then we can start. Okay, so um, my name is Salim Pizurik. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Whaley. And before we start, maybe just shortly to introduce the company. Um, so we've been around from 2014. Uh, we have about 50 enterprise customers from Australia, Japan to uh, Europe and US. And our main um, product is actually the automation uh, platform that interconnects on one hand the IoT networks, sensor networks, uh, factory floors from SCADA and PLCs together with the IT systems, so-called API economy. Uh, from databases, uh, log files to CRM systems, asset management. And what actually our customers do on top of that, they build the use cases uh, through our automation technology. Um, and my talk today will be about a, a service, obviously. And what actually interested me a lot uh, for the past decade is how on earth you can actually build an application with this construction, which is just one function. And if you look back at servers, not to talk about servers versus uh, fast. So uh, to, to go back to what uh, Venus said back in 2016, uh, we are moving from uh, thinking about the cloud as a platform as a service from the simple service and the networking sort of problems in having uh, application developers only focusing on their application where you actually let other people manage machines for you. Now, um, the next thing that I would like to introduce is actually it's a great paper from Berkeley about a uh, view on the service computing. And even if you look at this slide from bottom up, we see that we are actually shifting the paradigm from uh, basic uh, infrastructure uh, services to something as a cloud functions, objects, object store, storage, key value databases, and so forth and so forth. And further on, if you look at um, what all major players have today, they we basically see that the, the market has some, somehow converged to a set of uh, ingredients which are obviously available for on most of these platforms, uh, being AWS, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, or let's say in Asia, Alibaba, it's a pretty interesting uh, platform as well. Now, the thing is that, uh, and this is actually the, the covers where people start building the applications and if you like evangelizing how you build these applications, I just Google a little bit on the one way you can uh, do these things. Uh, basically what you uh, see in many of these use cases is that if you look at that from a distance, uh, you have some things like uh, API gateways, you have a stateless functions, you have some sort of a logic that you need to implement in the end. Then you have storages and queues and so forth and so forth. Um, and then again, if you, if, you, if, you, if you just step back and look at, so what actually you have as a developer, you have basically what I call a couple of hammers to play with. And you know the joke, if you have, the only thing you have is a hammer, then every other thing looks as a nail problem, so to speak. In, in serverless, you basically have a couple of these hammers and I would just like to introduce each of these separately. And obviously you guys know about these things. And the first, very first thing that you get, it's actually a Lambda function. Now, if you look at the very first uh, blog about uh, service or the functions, 
uh, uh, famous guy Martin Fuller already said, okay, it's it's interesting stuff. Uh, but guys, pay attention. Uh, there is a huge uh, impact on how you actually build the architecture using actually stateless uh, road of all the cloud functions. The next hammer, obviously, is the, the, that the, the, the function is stateless. Uh, still, application itself, it's stateful. So, meaning that you have to actually figure out where to put that state somewhere. And staying at, uh, at AWS in this particular example, the, the next hammer will be some sort of a persistent, being a DynamoB or any other NoSQL or SQL database, where you actually need to keep that state, such that actually can build application on top of that. And here you see here on the right hand side, again, the uh, inserts from the, the Berkeley paper, you really have to uh, figure out how to do these things. The next camera would be obviously queues, because if the data comes in um, pretty fast or you have to actually do some sort of the pipelining, you need to have some sort of a queues, SNS, SQS, or any other event bridge or measure and so forth. So you really need somehow to pile up these messages to be able to be processed. The have of four would be the object store. I really don't know who got the idea to make it, but I, uh, I'm, but it's just simply amazing idea that someone just uh, figured out to put an object store there. And I tried to Google who actually got that idea. Uh, might be true, might be not that it was supposed to be a malloc of a cloud. Um, and whoever did that, uh, you know, uh, great stuff. And finally, and this is something that you need to do in the end, it's to do the orchestration of these functions. So you need to have a function orchestrator somehow to stitch these together, these things. And basically my talk today and what we're gonna to try to represent are some novel ways actually to, to do this uh, service orchestration. Now, before we jump into that problem, uh, obviously there are some other problems that people need to talk about and it's actually observability, which is a big deal because a lot of things are moving left and right and you have to actually figure out what's going on. And there are many startups and many uh, companies looking at actually understanding and trying to figure out this problem for developers. The other actually challenge you have, it's should you avoid lock-in? Um, and there are two kinds of people that actually to try to solve that problem. It's one of them, it's, I'm just picking up here serverless as, as a company they're trying to put umbrella on top where actually delegate implementation of the cloud functions to the systems, meaning that you don't really have to care whether it's actually Amazon or Azure, or you can actually go open source all the way by having something like OpenFAS, uh, which tries to do things a little bit different by providing some sort of open source uh, derivative, uh, which does pretty much the same thing as uh, cloud functions, but also a little bit like a k-native thing. So this is another choice you have. And finally, so why we need an orchestrator? Uh, here I'm showing one example of a, a banking app uh, of the guy who actually tweeted uh, proudly that this is how his application looked like. <clears throat> this is a real thing. Um, and every vertex in this sphere, it's a cloud function. Um, and you really do wonder how actually these people develop these things uh, and how they actually understand what's going on around, which is actually, it's a pretty big problem. So, um, so what actually cloud providers have decided it's to enable people to write an application by one or the other way trying to wrap these functions. And if you look at, for instance, at the AWS, they decided to actually go with the finite state machine and if you look at here at this uh, red rectangle, you see how this actually the cloud functions got wrapped into a states and how some of the payloads have been used to actually understand should they actually branch to yes or no thing. That's one way to do that. Uh, Azure went uh, with something else. Uh, if people uh, remember still Yahoo pipes, it's actually flow engine uh, processing with the function chaining. And that's actually how they uh, have decided to orchestrate functions and, and have uh, people uh, benefiting from uh, building the application that way. Finally, something that happened, I believe two weeks ago, um, Google decided to actually come with what they call a workflow, which is kind of a strange thing. Um, I just here again, put in the rectangle, um, a YAML condition-based uh, application, to be honest. 
and the logic itself it's encoded in a switch statements that's not the way to do that obviously there are other ways to do it i'll actually talk about it later so what's actually the problem um if you do the function chain and here i have let's say four lambda functions and you just do that basically you are working with the lambda calculus and if you do something rather simple like if you look at the aws they will say if uh, i have my uh, input sensors the values go up and down and i'm just going to create a case then the function chain works and like i said earlier on uh, we are the company which is very focused on the automation in context of the iot that stuff can work this way but is it good enough in order to prove that things are a little bit more complicated in real life i showed you here uh, something else where rather than just having one input we have actually three different events x y and z while x and y are coming as streams from a sensor networks and you might want to branch off by having a threshold crossing where on a deep, different values you need to do some other things and stitch other functions let's say lambda three and five depending on the threshold crossing and now you have to merge that with another stream uh input variable y which again can have a threshold crossing and what if you say that both x and y has to be below threshold to do something then you have to do the stream merging which is like lambda six and lambda four and on top of that if you'd like to fetch data from the api economy which you're polling let's say every 10 minutes how you merge this thing and the argument i have is here that uh neither final state machines can deal with that because with the final state machine there is only one input before things start branching or if you do the simple uh, flow energy processing then they have another problem with the branching and understand what's going on on top of that you have to merge the streams and then how you introduce a polling function it's actually a pretty hard problem and if you look back at the berkeley paper which actually talks about weak spots they also have indicated this uh, challenges and one of them is indeed how you actually have a, a, any some sort of a fine grade coordination where the task a uses task b output and there must be a way for a to know when the inputs are available the second problem it's about coordination and signaling you know sharing the states between the functions and you really sometimes want to say when the conditions are met then only then execute something else so that signal is also a pretty tough problem to solve having a stateless functions and finally there is also a need for uh exchange uh, if you have the uh, parallel things they have to share something for a shared context and that indeed uh, introduce immediately the need for a database and need uh, some sort of the automation and that's actually again i'm just here highlighting that step functions it's a progress in that direction so again they are understanding the need for orchestrator to be able to deal with this challenge so what is actually the weak spot of the um, function composition so to speak it's first it's data passing between the functions uh what how you express the time how long the data is valid is it five minutes ten minutes one hour you want to merge the streams from the machines you would not like to uh mix things from a day before with something which is coming now so how to express the the, the logic which goes beyond the trivia of threshold crossing uh and then how to actually survive the context meaning that the state uh, needs to be kept somewhere uh, which goes beyond uh, just one input data because you might want to have a consecutive values which you need to combine together if the machine drops something and comes back is it the same event or is it a different event and that's actually something which is uh, happening in real life and to to make it more concrete i have taken here uh, one default picture again i'm picking up something from uh, you know just googling and uh, this is Typically, what we are dealing with, uh, of uh, every day in my company, you have some uh, devices that are pushing data to the cloud. And typically, you have a pub sub there, you're doing the cloud functions, you have a data flow, then you do the BigQuery analytics, and so forth and so forth. So, how hard this can be? Well, actually, it's pretty hard. Because if you look at a uh, underneath what's going on, you will have some maybe Apache uh, beam for the ETL processing and pushing data to the BigQuery. You might have a data stream analytics you might have a big tables and so forth and so forth and it all looks uh, good 
But what's actually happen, happening in the background is that you can say, well, I on the left hand side I have my sensor and I have my digital twin, which is, which is actually a composite of three things. It's a data which is coming, it's, up, it's commands, my capabilities, what I can do with that sensor, and the configuration settings. And this stuff, it's not coming together with the strip. It's something else which is defined as a digital twin. And if you use the Apache Beam, where you actually use this information to get the data stream, you have to dump it in the data. Then you have to actually bring some other stuff, put it in a NoSQL database or any other, and generate reports. The other option you have, it's now where the hammers are coming. It's say, wait, 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 wait. I'm just going to push data in S3 buckets, uh, put my triggers on top of that, and do the batch processing. And now I have a little bit more of a freedom to start combining all these things and fetch data around and try to basically pick up some other and cherry pick some other information before I do the batch process. You see often these sort of use cases when you do the machine learning models where basically you, you batch things, you stop, uh, put the stuff in the uh, mastery bucket and then you basically take it again and run machine learning models uh, on, on top of this data. The other approach is that you say, well, Next to that, I will actually introduce a stream processing like uh, Spark or any other single uh, stream engine. And what I'm going to start doing that is I actually do the stream and query filtering. What does it mean? It's that I will do something like a SQL query on a stream, uh, on a region, or on threshold crossing. But then if I would like to do the threshold crossing on a digital twin values, then I have to fetch that at the moment that the stream is coming. How I actually do that? How you combine it together with API if you would like to check the asset uh, identity of the digital twin, which comes maybe from Salesforce? Are you going to stop the stream? This is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Or if I would like to fetch data from another database, you cannot do that. Meaning that are you just going to do the stream query as a rule anyway, because I'll start filtering something, and then I'll just start firing the Lambda functions, or then start the workflows. And then you suddenly have a rules in two places. One, it's in a stream engine, and the other one, it's in a workflow. This is actually happening. Or actually you can say, well, you know, I'm just gonna throw the data into my uh, lambdas and just do the fan out, and then how fast you can go, and whether you can actually step, uh, step back and say, okay, now they have this data, again, I have to fetch data from other places. So what are the hard choices? Uh, choice one is that you do the rules with S3 and lambdas, and you have a huge fan out of functions, and who knows what's happening. Uh, choice two is actually do the stream notics followed by orchestrator. How then you add new rules? How do you mix APIs and how you add other sources? It's a problem. Or choice three, where you actually do the orchestration topic into stream directory. But how fast this can be? How you can add the rules of a particular type for a given device? Not all devices are for the same type. So if you want to have a machine, uh, let's say washing machine of type one with one rule and machine type of uh, the other with another rule, how you actually can do these things? How you can mix these rules? How you can actually introduce the rest interfaces on top of that? And that's actually a problem. Now, the other thing that people often, remember, uh, often forget is that if you start branching, you end up with something else, which is called, uh, which is called uh, the curse of dimension, dimensionality problem. Let's take another example here. If you have input variable X, which has a, two thresholds, low, medium, high, and you would like to mix that with another uh, Y value, which also has a three threshold crossing, you end up with actually three, 31 nodes just to be able to come with true and false. And with six Boolean attributes, you get to a number which is actually hard to, uh, you know, read here. But trust me, it's going uh, up to the limit of the number of atoms in the universe. So that's actually a problem as you start branching. It's pretty hard problem to implement the rule, which even in this example looks actually pretty simple. The other thing is if you use the flows and you just start splitting things, um, you really have a, a pretty tough problem because on top of the branching, you actually have to split things as you're doing the branching. And, um, and, and if you know Node-RED, this is actually a philosophy of Node-RED and uh, for, for small device or small use case, actually, it can still work out. But again, it's actually pretty tough once you start actually thinking about that uh, and putting it in production, 
for everything that is less, if you like, than, than obvious simple use case. So when, when we started the company, we realized that actually to, uh, to do these things, is there a different way to actually think about this problem? And what we realized is actually automation, it's actually start topology. Meaning that at the moment that you're doing the automation, you have to have a constant connection to all kinds of different sources, being the stream data, being the historical data, what they call in the SCADA world historians. You need access to the machine models. You need the access to the meta models, to digital twins, to the ERP systems, to notifications, to external APIs. And how you can actually do that? Now, what you actually need, you need the two sort of things. You need to solve the problem of coordination and signaling, and you also need to understand how to deal with the control flow decisions. What I mean by signaling is that the order in which information is gathered uh, needs to be provided at the moment information is available. And secondly, sometimes you're interested in some particular information, only some other information is available. That is to say, maybe I'm interested in the weather forecast only if I'm going to out to actually run. Otherwise, I'm not interested in that information. And, and, and secondly, why my decision should be immediate when information is available? It depends, actually. So you need somehow to decouple this, uh, the, this the, these things uh, to be able to actually uh, to address these challenges. So, what is this talk about? Uh, there is something called the Bayesian networks, and they are known in the AI world as, as, as a means to actually introduce the causal thinking um, into your knowledge modeling. Uh, but there is also some other interesting properties of the basin networks. Uh, typically, uh, here I will be talking about the discrete uh, basin networks, which is often overlooked. And this is about the message passing. That is to say how fast we can talk to each other and know what is going on. And in this example, I'm actually making make it more, maybe more uh, easy, is that at any moment information is available, I can propagate this to the network so that everybody know else knows what's going on inside the network. And uh, to make it maybe more clear, I'm just gonna try now to switch my screen and please stay with me because um, this is just a little bit of a crash course into the Bayesian networks. So what is this thing doing here? I have a car which needs to start, uh, obviously because I need the fuel, I need the electronics to work and I need the battery to be okay. And if you look at here at the right uh, bottom, uh, the target that, that I can start the car obviously depends on many different things. And if I say that the battery is okay, in this particular case, it's not flat, the chance of my car uh, starting is much higher. And if my electronics is working, then even it's a higher chance that uh, my car will be starting. And if I have a fuel and other things, then uh, I will be more likely to be able to start a car. On the other hand, if my, uh, for instance, lights are broken, uh, it's very likely that it's actually caused by the battery being flat, which means that I'm less likely to be able to start my car. What we see doing is that as I'm doing this uh, observation, information is immediately flowed through the network and every other node knows what is the other node feeling, so to speak. And that was actually got me to idea, hey, can I use this sort of, uh, belief propagation invent flooding as a means to orchestrate service functions. Because imagine now if each of these nodes is some sort of a stateless function which is just giving me the observation. That's actually very interesting. Now, let me then switch now back to the presentation. Because uh, I will keep these slides uh, for the future reference if people are really interested in how the basic networks work, because obviously this is more known in the machine learning uh, audience rather than in the service uh, world. But again, what is interesting about inference is that you can get the information, you can think of this as a discrete nodes, and as soon as something is happening, some other nodes are filling that information. The other concept which I'd like to introduce it's related to the smart agent concept. And again, I'm not going to talk way too much about this thing. There is a plenty of and smarter people who actually can elaborate on this more uh, eloquently than I can. 
But let me just explain uh, quickly what actually the smart agent concept. Smart agent concept, it's about saying, okay, I can sense environment, I can think about it and act about it back into environment. And let's go again about this next. Uh, my actions will change the environment. I will sense it again, reason about it, and act again on that environment. This is a basic concept of the, of the smart agent. And if you think about what you can do in, uh, with this concept, you can think of environment as the IoT platform, social media location, open data, whatever. You'll perceive that information, you'll flood the network, think about it, and act back on the environment. Now, if you put these things together, what we can actually do is that we can think of the stateless functions as a nodes in the basin network, where well, the only thing you have to actually do is to type that uh, function in a similar way as the, the finite state machine AWS guys could thought about it, because they are actually wrapping the functions in a, some sort of a state. And the second thing they can actually do is you do the actuation, it's just a fire and forget call, which is just a pure function. So basically what you're doing that in the end, you're creating the library, your domain specific language based on the files. And then let's have a fun. How does it work? It's that you start uh, wrapping your Lambda function in the sensors, which give you information like whether out it's maybe sunny or not sunny. I can go to the API and come back with that information. I can reason about these things. And then as the outcome of that, I can fire things back into the environment. Uh, and then actually can do some interesting things like uh, if two sensors come together, I will gonna infer this information and based on this outcome, I'll be firing the actuation back into the environment. Now, to make it a little bit more interesting, uh, I think it's better that I start with some demos because it will be much more interesting than looking at the slides. So let me go back into environment. And what I'm gonna do now is that I will basically start firing uh, a measurements for a patient, let's call him a Steve. And what I'm gonna do now, I will basically uh, every second push some measurements like a temperature, heart rate, uh, and, and, and some other body measurements into the environment. So basically right now uh, doing it, I'm actually streaming some data for a patient Steve into the environment. And if we look here, uh, this will be the data as it is coming from, um, uh, let's say the instrument uh, for a patient Steve. That's all what I'm doing now. And to prove it here, I have here a small visualization which is gonna show me the same thing. The next thing I will do I will take a, um, a template, and this is something like, if you like a, a, a rules engine. And what I'm gonna do now, I will actually put things together that um, are, are, are telling me something about a patient. Now, each of these things is gonna be a cloud function. So let's just read it loud what actually I'm doing here. I will take a measurement and I will see whether it's in the range or not. And if I fire this function, let's say, I have a measurement of 100 and the range has to be, let's say 20 and target it's 90. And if I fire that, I will see I'm in range. So the function says, okay, you it's 100, it's plus minus uh, 90 plus minus 20. And if I have a measurement of 130, then what is gonna happen is I will be above uh, desired outcome. And that's what I actually see here, above. And what I actually see here, it's that function which is just uh, basically doing nothing but a simple threshold pressing. What I'm gonna do now, and here I have uh, quite a few uh, of these uh, measurements. And what I'm gonna do now here is that we'll actually have something like a majority voting, in which case I'm gonna announce that there is a problem with this patient because some of his body temperature are actually pretty bad. And here you see how this thing can be easily configured and remember the stuff from the, on, the, on the branching. If you, if you try to, de to describe that through the decision trees, there'll be hell a lot of uh, branches to actually even uh, put on one screen. I, I guess probably 50 screens would not be enough to actually put it all together. And um, if um, 
we want to, to actually desire to actually monitor this patient in um, in real uh, real time. Uh, what I'm going to do is say, okay, uh, let's start now uh, running this and see what's happening. Now, each of these cloud functions is is executed independently, but I'm jointly merging these streams. And what's happening now that you actually see whether this uh, patient has a problem or not. And if each of uh, these cases, we are seeing that there is a, a particular problem, we'll be launching some alarms. Uh, we also can uh, notify, uh, actually see here, that you also can do uh, something uh, I called before, like a context uh, statefulness, because they're measuring whether there is a particular drop uh, with some particular measurements. Again, this is something that comes from the, uh, from the real um, patient monitoring system, and this is actually an uh, implementation of, of one of these uh, rules uh, in real life. And um, basically, if, I, if I'm to follow what's going on here, um, I can see that now we are already generating alarms because there is a particular general condition which is met, and we are having a problem. But again, notice here, we are still not in the uh, so-called sepsis stock because I don't still have infection for this patient. And if, you, if the guy gets really infectious, uh, infectious, you can actually monitor it from here. If the guy is actually having infection at the same time, and I have this condition here, I will actually get a customer call, sorry, get a patient call because uh, the guy is really getting in trouble. So what they're gonna do now, I will basically put the guy in infection state. That's what I'm doing here. And this moment in time. Sepsis shock for the patient's teeth. I repeat sepsis shock for the patient's teeth. So what happened is that I got a call. And if you look at this cloud function, this is nothing but a Twilio call, which was actually sending me back and saying, okay, uh, there is a problem. Uh, the guy got in a sepsis shock. And if I come back here, what you will see now is that we've got a Steve in a pretty bad shape and he got a sepsis shock. So this is one example of what I was talking before, of being able to orchestrate cloud functions and being able to merge the streams and being able to uh, basically orchestrate these, uh, these things without actually taking care of the context merging and creating rules. It's everything is visual and everything can be basically uh, deployed at a runtime for any number of patients. Here I'm putting in debug mode, but you can actually associate that together uh, with, with some types and then apply that for all patients in the room. And yeah, so for instance, if I'm looking here at the, at the floor, I actually see that in this particular room, there is a Steve that will be uh, in the alarm. And if you look at here, indeed, I go back to the patient and see actually what are his, uh, uh, body temperature and other things, and I indeed see here that I had a alarm that uh, was generated by the rules agent itself. Now, for the other example, to basically show how these things uh, can work, uh, I have prepared a little bit more complicated use case, uh, because what you can actually also do, and let me explain this one, um, it's another problem that you often have, is that speaking about the digital twins, is that like a machine on the functional flow, it's not necessarily to know only one particular measurement. You might want to know the combination of these measurements and how they reference each other. What is the role of each of these particular measurements? In this particular case, what I have, I have actually a simple car or rather a truck, which has six tires. And I would guess that if, tire, if one of these two tires is flat, I can still drive. But if one of these two, it's actually flat, actually I have a really big problem. If I have two of these flat, then obviously that I'm knocking it down the, the rear left side of it. So what I'm gonna do now is that I will bring another kind of a um, template. So first of all, what I need to do is to basically create a car which has a six, six different reference objects. I have a six tires, but basically each of them has a specific crawl. And in this case, I have sensors which are put on six different tires. And my template in this particular case, it looks like this. So I have 
Let's read together. If one of these guys is below, I don't have actually a problem, but if this tire is bad and this one is bad, you can actually this or configuration, then I actually have a problem. Or if both of these tires are bad, then also have a problem. So again, if one of these two tires is flat, I don't have a problem unless both of them are flat. While for the front wheel, front uh, tires rather, if any of this is in problem, I immediately have a problem with the car. So again, what I'm gonna do is that I will actually start this uh, in what I call a reactive stream mode. Let's see if I have a car and let's start the monitoring. So there is no data coming. The functions are just sitting idle there. And in this particular case, uh, I will try to probably push something through the MQTT broker. And what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna put a pressure of 2.1 bars. And what I see now here is that, let me just put here maybe 1.1 on tire. Let me check here what's going on, just to be sure. I actually fired immediately tire two, which meant I have actually a problem. I'm below the threshold. So my car, it's actually having already a problem. If I had first put the other tire, uh, in this particular case, uh, let's say tire six in there and push it to actually 1.1 bar, then I would actually have a less of a problem because there is only, uh, there is a still tire four, which is gonna be supporting this car to drive on. And again, this is something that you can immediately inspect and, and see it directly in your screen. What is also nice is that if you come back tomorrow and ask yourself what was going on, you can actually go to the running, uh, actually a, a, a system and see, okay, hold on a second, I had a problem because this tire was flat. And you see here something from the uh, basin networks. I have actually probability of 100% that this tire is bad, meaning that also I'm sure that the car got in trouble. Now, this is, um, this is very interesting. Now, I would just like to prove that with this engine, you can also create a flow engine and final state machine uh, basically uh, in a matter of seconds. So uh, let's see what actually I can do there. I will pick up one cloud function, uh, which is kind of funny. So uh, let's actually have a look what is this guy doing here. It's a cloud function that's just throwing a dice. And whenever I execute this one, it doesn't need any input arguments. I will be toggling between one of the possible six states because I'm gonna pick up the random value and depending on the thresholds, I'll just go from the dice. And if I just now go here and start running this guy every two seconds, I will be just throwing the dice and what you see here happening every two seconds, I will be basically getting to one of these possible six different states. Now, if I would like to launch additional cloud function, and if I'd like to do it as a flow engine, basically can do everything this way, just putting them together that one gets executed after the other one. And basically what I'm doing now, I'm throwing three dices in a flow engine way. And when the dice one is finished, then execute dice two, and then execute dice three, and so forth and so forth. This is actually what's happening here. Now, if I would like to make a finite state machine out of that, I actually can do something else. So I can actually throw the dice here and say, well, if it's only one, then I'm gonna execute dice four. Uh, or I can actually say I'm gonna execute dice five if I'm going from a transition from let's say one to two, and only then execute dice five. And again, if I start that, I will now having both flow engine and a finite state machine at the same time. Now I can even actually do some more funny things. Is to say if I would like to play a bingo and have these dice being, let's say six, let's uh, test my luck and have this guy here, then I might actually would like to have a message that I want to bingo. And I'm just now throwing another cloud function which says here, bingo. And let's do it again. And what's happening now is that, as you see, we're gonna test my love for a couple of seconds. 
and let's see what happens. So I'm having the flow engine, dice one, two, and three, and I have a conditional execution of dice four, depending on the outcome of dice one, and the same it's, oh, I got a bingo, excellent. So at one moment I had both of these uh, dice is turning sex. And this is another example, actually, how you can actually chain the functions and either create out of them a flow engines on the final state machine. Um, the other thing that actually can be also fun is that uh, how you can survive the root context between the two consecutive values. Uh, and I don't, for the, for the sake of time, I don't have that much uh, uh, time to actually explain all these things. But uh, just for the fun, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to have a flip sensor, which is going to be flipping between zero and ones. And notice that means that I need to remember somehow that my previous state was zero because I would like to flip to one. And when it's one, go back to zero. And what I'm going to do now, I create a digital counter, uh, analog digital counter, so to speak, based on uh, flip flops. Uh, and here we go. What's happening now, I have a transition that is going to be at 15 through by all of these guys being one, while there is a condition execution as I'm moving between one and zero between each of these values. And notice now when I'm actually at 15, I actually flipped the count 15, which meant actually uh, I was somehow able to survive uh, context, uh, which was provided to function between two, two consecutive measurements. For people who are interested in that, uh, obviously there is a um, immediate um, response or an immediate explanation because at each moment in time, you can actually get into a, um, a cloud function and see actually how we do that. We are surviving the context, we are pushing back into the rules context and providing back to the, to the calling function for the next uh, consecutive uh, calls. So this is a little bit about the, the if you like, mixing the uh, basin networks together uh, with the smart agent concept and being able to express this sort of orchestration that way. So this is basically what uh, this slide is talking about. Um, there is a way to co coordinate signaling when the function should be executed versus the control flow decisions, what are gonna do about these things and notice these things are decoupled. Now, the other thing that we often uh, see is that how fast this can be, because if you remember in the streams, you basically call the lambda function, you're paying the penalty of, if nothing else, round three delay, uh, delay plus actually the function execution. Uh, and what I would like to show you here is that we have something inside the engine itself, which also behaves as a cloud function, which is in memory processing. And it's, uh, it's, it's a native call, and it's uh, the same sort of a class as the cloud function, which is delegated to another server, so to speak. And notice here that 99 percentile is 0.02 nanoseconds. So again, if you have the stream process, you can use the cloud functions, either which are natively in the engine, or delegate some of these functions as a pure lambdas. And by the way, here you have a two set of lambda functions. Some of them are just like a functions, and some of them are calling external APIs, in which case you should actually add at least another 100 to 200 milliseconds because it's something needs to be called and come back to you. And this is another thing that, that people often forget is that doing the, the stream analytics, rather stream uh, processing, they really have to take into account these times. I show you these things. This is more about uh, being able to express the relations between objects together with the service uh, automation. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a demo that I showed here. I'm looking at my clock. I'm probably uh, at the end of this presentation. Should you like to know more, uh, please uh, go to our website. And if the time permits, I will still look at uh, some of the questions. Uh, should be some uh, uh, here at, at, uh, at the chat. So, all right, so uh, I can pass uh, back to, uh, to the moderator.